Hey ladies, I hope you're doing well. Um, our little video today, our little lecture video is gonna be on chapter six um, and it's called Using the Electronic Health Record for Reimbursement. And it actually starts on page 107 for the newer book, which is the, what is it? Third edition. But in the second edition, it's like uh, 101, 100, you know, it's right there. What I want to talk about is I want to look at the healthcare reimbursement section. I do want to point out again that you guys really need to pay close attention to these um, key terms that we're using. Uh, they're just going to be important. You need to know them. Um, what I wanted to talk about with this is uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from it. The very first um, sentence says the process of submitting insurance claims involves complete attention to detail to ensure that all the information included is accurate. The implementation, implement, implementation <laughs> of electronic health records, EHRs, and, and operable, interoperable practice management systems, I am going to get it together, I promise, has made this process much easier. At first, learning the reimbursement requirements for several insurance payers can seem overwhelming, but it's more useful to think of billing and coding activities as a kind of puzzle. So, you know, we talk about how it tells everything about someone. A different puzzle piece here, different puzzle piece here, different puzzle piece here, and whenever you put them all together, it's going to give a complete uh, story for the third party payer. Okay, so I want to move down to the next paragraph where it says working with medical reimbursement means submitting claims to big insurance companies or the federal government, Medicare or Medicaid, who are known as third party payers. Who's the largest third party payer? in the United States, Medicare. Just, you know, remember that. Okay, um, when, okay, for third party. Okay, I'm gonna get it together. Okay, so who then are the first and second parties? So already we know the third party payer are the insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. So who are the first and second parties. Well, the patient or the guarantor would be the first party and the provider would be the second party. So the third party is insurance companies. The first party is the guarantor or the patient and the second party is actually the physician or the provider. So I felt like those were important things to point out. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about what you find on the other side of that page. It has deductible, deductible has not been met. Um, I really, really want you guys to read over that and make sure, know what a deductible is, know what coinsurance is, know what code, uh, I'm sorry, know what copay, coinsurance, deductible, uh, allowed amount, all of those things, all of those words, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to go and look at that. Okay, so now I'm gonna run through some slides with you. And we're gonna just kind of do an overview of the reimbursement. Okay, oh, I forgot to do something. I'm just gonna uh, talk to you guys. I'd like for you to turn to page 102, second edition, and 108, third edition. I want you to look at that little uh, revenue cycle components. Okay, so let's just verbally talk about those things right now. So the first thing is your scheduling and your registration. Second thing is your medical record doc documentation. The third thing is you're going to bill. You're going to capture those charges. The medical record documentation, that's your encounter, your encounter form, diagnosis, CPT codes. Then you go to your charge capture, which is your billing cycle. You're putting in your, um, your date of service and you're billing those things. Next, you're going to submit those claims. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to begin to be paid for those claims which are payment posting, third party follow up, rejection processing, that's any claims that you sent out to be paid and they've rejected them for whatever reason. And the next part of that is the appeal, sending out the corrected information to get paid. So that is what a revenue cycle is. 
So I just wanted to point that, point that out. I'm sorry that I got excited about our slides and didn't say anything. Okay, so overview of reimbursement. You're gonna be submitting insurance claims to a third party payer. You're gonna use the HIPAA 5010 claim format, patient payments, out-of-pocket expenses, co-payment, co-insurances, and deductibles. <coughs> Remember, I gave you that list to make sure you know what those things mean. EH, EHRs have integrated practice management systems to provide billing functions. Okay, so the revenue cycle. We just went over that, so I don't think we need to go any further with this slide. Next, we're going to talk about coding systems. Medical coding is the process of assigning standard numeric or alphanumeric codes to diagnoses, procedures, and treatments for reimbursement purposes. So ICD-10 CM, International Classification of Diseases, 10th Revision with Clinical Modification. That's our ICD-10 manual, okay? CPT, Current Procedural Terminology, CPT. Healthcare Procedure Coding System, HCPSCS. That we call that HICPICS, sorry, it's the HICPICS, okay. Guys, for your NCCT, you're going to need to know that ICD-10-CM stands for International Classification of Diseases 10th Revision with Clinical Modifications. You're gonna need to know what each one of these things stand for. So please take the time, if you don't know, to write it down and learn it. Role of the EHR in the medical, in medical coding. Okay. Hang on, I need to get <laughs> on the right page. Part of the medical assistant's job is to ensure that the patients are billed and credited properly, to see that insurance claims are submitted correctly, and to follow up on unpaid claims and delinquent patient accounts. So what does the EHR do? It can store complete sets of codes, links codes to appropriate findings in the patient's progress note. You can post payments submit insurance claims, and quick follow-up on unpaid patient accounts. Coding and claims processing er errors. What can be some errors? Coding variances, mistakes caused by computer error or by human error of, error of various sorts, ranging from simple carelessness to incorrect application of coding guidelines and procedures, and coding requires complete and accurate documentation. CPT coding. The CPT system introduced in 1992 is now in its fourth edition. It was devised by the AMA, American Medical Association, at the request of the Federal Government Center for Medicare and Medicaid Systems, CMS. The purpose of the system was to standardize the way in which claims are submitted to the CMS, which is re responsible for issuing periodic rules and guidelines for how the codes may be applied and for conducting audits when fraud is suspected. Okay, I just said all of that what I've said here, uh, what's on the slide, but I'm gonna read exactly what's on the slide. CPT coding is uniform language for describing procedures and treatments performed by healthcare providers. Okay, so some of you already know this, some of you don't. In our CPT, category one codes are your evaluation and management codes, your anesthesia, your surgery, your radiology, your pathology and laboratory, and your medicine. Those are called category one codes. Category two codes are supplemental codes used to help researchers collect data, track illness and disease, and measure quality of care. If you have tabbed your CPT book, you have a category two tab. You can see those codes there. Category three codes are temporary codes applied to emerging, emerging technology. 
So now we're going to go into ICD 10 CM coding. Translates complex medical diagnoses and procedures into a universal language used by healthcare providers to request reimbursement for inpatient hospital services, hospital based outpatient services, and doctor office visits. It's overseen by the CMS and the National Center, Center for Health Dis Statistics, consists of about 70,000 codes. It is important to remember that the codes must directly reflect the healthcare provider's documentation without making assumptions. If there is any question, the healthcare provider should be consulted. You query the physician. Codes are three to seven alphanumeric characters. ICD-10 has 21 chapters without supplementary classifications. Coding conventions include parentheses, non-essential modifiers, C, see also placeholder X, use of a seventh character, C category for cross-reference, exclude notes, code also notes, and default code and syndromes. Okay, so if you've never opened your ICD-10 book, when we get there, you're gonna be able to understand a lot more of what these things actually mean. I enjoy the ICD-10 so much. It's to me, it's so much fun. Okay, there's an alphabetic index of diseases. It contains diagnostic terms in alphabetical order. It contains alphabetic index of disease and injury, a table of neoplasm and a table of drugs and chemicals. The tabular list of diseases is organized by chapters in alphanumeric order official guidelines for coding and reporting, and there's four sections. Section one is conventions, general coding guidelines, and chapter specific guidelines. Section two, maybe this is on the next one. No, I'm sorry. Section two is selection of principal diagnosis. Selection, section three is reporting additional diagnosis, and section four is diagnostic coding and reporting guidelines for outpatient services. P4P, pay for performance. This model is quickly becoming gold standard by mo which most healthcare plans such as uh, HMOs and PPOs operate. It's an outcomes based payment model and the rewards providers for delivering evidence based care according to specific standards electronically documenting compliance with those standards. Let's talk about the incentives and penalty. In 2009, providers who used a computerized provider order entry, CPO, P, entry, CPOE, gosh guys, sorry, system to submit claims for Part D Medicare recipients were rewarded with performing performance pay amount of 2% of their annual Medicare billing. It has been phased out now though. Providers who choose not to use CPOE are now dinged with a penalty equal to 2% of their annual Medicare billing. So if you don't do this system, they actually make you pay 2% out of your Medicare reimbursement. Use of the EHR for P4P compliance. EHR, offer, EHR offers a way to record improvement by noting laboratory results, findings of imaging studies, and clinical progress notes. P4P model works best when applied to patients with chronic illness, such as diabetes, hypertension, and arthritis. Okay, I wanna say something about the P4P compliance. This is what I want to tell you. Whenever I was working at ACS, it was called PQRS. That's what we called it. So what would happen is once a year, we would go through and we would find out how many times uh, one of our cardiology doctors actually prescribed aspirin to help as blood thinner. And they would get so many points for that. Then they would get so many points for uh, Coumadin, Coumadin checks. And they would get so many points for A, B, C, or D. So every time they 
they needed eight out of 10 patients to have certain things. And that was part of the P for P compliance. I don't know if that makes more sense to you, but that's actually what that was for. Okay, so let's talk about our super bill. It's also known as an encounter form, a walkout form, a routing slip, a fee slip, and a checkout form. It is attached to the patient's chart for use during an office visit, and patient's copy of the encounter form serves as a bill. Okay, this is what you're gonna be doing your billing off of, because it tells you the date of service, what CPT codes they used, and then what diagnosis codes were added to that. We always call them super bills. Okay, this is an electronic super bill that you can see from your SIMS chart. Pretty interesting, huh? For Mr. Kyle Reeves. The super bill, the, the form, I'm sorry, the super bill, the form includes the following information. Demographic data, which is your patient's name, address, phone number, and date of birth date of the appointment, the guarantor, which is the person responsible for the account, the insurance policy number and group ID, diagnosis codes, service codes and ranking, and the account balance. So patient ledger, oh my goodness. Okay guys, I was studying the NCCT stuff this, uh, this weekend. Patient ledger is all over the place. Super bill and patient ledger. So please let's pay close attention. The ledger is located in the left info panel of the coding and billing module. It is not linked to the patient's encounter, which also allows the user to document payments and charges at any time. So search by patient name, ledger is organized by the responsible payer. Documentation of all charges, payments, adjustments, and balances to an account. And its access is not limited by patient encounter. Okay, so what do I want you to remember about a patient ledger? What does a patient ledger, what is it? Okay, I am actually looking in our book because I wanna see, I want to give the um, definition that's actually in the book. Well, why can't I find it? Okay, so we're just gonna go with this. What is on a, what do you use a patient ledger for? To document all charges, payments, adjustments, and balances to an account. What do you use a patient ledger for? Documentation of all charges, payments, adjustments, and balances to an account. That's what a patient ledger is, is used for. I actually am giving you guys the practice EHR, NCCT test. Um, I'm trying to look to see when I actually have it going in. Oh, I can't see it right now. I will let you guys know later, but that is a practice test and I'm looking forward to you getting in there and seeing what you know on that. Okay, HIPAA 5010 claim processing. Once the super bill is submitted, it's time to request reimbursement for services from the third party payer, which is our insurance, right? The electronic format of the claim form is the HIPAA 5010. If it's a paper form, it's the, HIP, uh, it's the CMS 1500 form, but the electronic form of that is the HIPAA 5010. Once the claim is submitted, it is paid pending or denied. Once a claim is submitted, it is paid pending or denied. Okay, so let's talk about medical necessity. The provider's establishment of medical necessity ensures that a patient's treatment is consistent with the diagnosis and is provided in the appropriate setting under adequate supervision. A legal doctrine that holds the medical service rendered must be reasonable and necessary according to generally accepted clinical standards. A lot of times you have to have a pre-authorization. EHR's reporting capabilities can be used to identify codes that are being consistently rejected. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ne medical necessity. Okay, I'm gonna go to the cardiologist because I'm having shortness of breath. So I'm at the cardi cardiologist, they bill me, or they, they get my CPT codes together, and then they give me a diagnosis of 
a corn on my foot. I know that's comical. That does not meet medical necessity. It has to be something cardiology related. It can't be that I have a corn on my right big toe. That's a podiatrist, right? So it's got to meet medical necessity. I know that was a comical way of putting that, but I hope you get the point that it has to meet medical necessity. Next, we're going to talk about fraud and abuse. So we really, really, really need to know these definitions. Fraud is a misrepresentation. <laughs> Let's try that again. Fraud is a misrepresentation of the medical services provided to deceive or mislead another person or entity such as Medicare. That is fraud. Abuse is an unintentional deception in which a provider inappropriately bills for services that are not medically necessary, do not meet current standards of care, are not medically sound. Fraud is purposeful. Abuse is unintentional. For this particular situation, that is what fraud and abuse mean. So remember that fraud is an intentional misrepresentation of, abuse is an unintentional deception. Patient statements. Generating a patient statement is how the healthcare facility lets the patient know what is, is owed and why. It looks very much like what the information looks like on the patient's ledger, and it keeps money flowing in on a steady basis. Reporting features of an EHR. EHR must be able to generate reports that can be used in multiple ways within the healthcare facility. There are going to be very, uh, various aging reports. Aging reports are also called AR reports. That's what we call them in our facility. It will be used to determine what actions should be taken, report listing patient accounts and balances, Provider productivity can also be looked at by the office manager, and the reporting function can be used for quality assurance measures. We always used aging reports. We would get them once a month, and we could tell who uh, had a balance on their account that was patient responsibility, and then uh, what was still out to insurance. Okay, that is the end. I'm gonna stop our share. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I felt it was very, very important to share all the things that I shared. Um, I want you to know that insurance and a claims process, uh, we have to know so much of that for NCCT. And um, so I'm trying to uh, hit as many things that I feel like that are important in these little lectures. Some of the stuff, it, you know, that like the 5010 form, that is the electronic format of the form. That's so important. CMS 1500 form is the paper. So it's just little things like that that we have to remember for our test and um, that I'm trying to make sure that I'm pointing out as we go. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and I'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye.